Hi, my name is Justin Leader. I'm from New York and I'm here in Israel and I love it. We're having a great time. The weather's beautiful and we've been learning a lot. And it's great to get a lot of uh, information about our background. Take care, we'll see you soon. It's been awesome so far. Um, we just got done going to Jerusalem and uh, saw the Western Wall and all that and it was just it's crazy. I've never been here. It's unbelievable. from New York <laughs> and um, I love Israel and I can't wait to learn about the Technion. Hi, I'm Jessica Bigelson and I'm from New Jersey. I'm having an amazing time at Birthright and I love Israel and can't come, wait to come back next time. Hello, my name is Daniel Hutter. I'm from Los Angeles, California. It's my first time in Israel on the Tuckley Birthright group. I absolutely love Israel. The food has been amazing. Everyone has been amazing, so nice. The soldiers that are with us are truly open, they're sharing their experiences. It's been a one in a lifetime experience and I'm even looking at the Technion School right now. They have an amazing graduate level program for education with science, which is what I'm trying to do. I want to become a physics teacher. I was an engineering major in switching. This looks like an amazing program and I'm so happy to be here. Uh, one of the things that's fantastic to be standing in front of you is one, I share a really close path with most of you. I didn't grow up here. Uh, I, didn't, I wasn't born in Israel. I did not speak the language. I didn't go to school here. I did not do birthright, unfortunately. But I just went on vacations here. So, you know, on paper, nothing brought me eventually to bring my path to, to, to meet in Israel. So it can happen to anybody. And a little bit about what on earth do I teach? Uh, well, this is also going to sound completely mysterious. I'm basically a mechanical engineer who studies how flows move. So think of like air around an airplane or blood in a vessel. That's basically the kind of stuff, the physics that I study. So I teach essentially two broad branches of classes, uh, which are blood circulation. Any potential MDs out there? He's there. Excuse me? DDS. I'm not American. Please help. <laughs> dentist. Ah, oh, they have all these movies where they all say, ah, oh, you're just a dentist. You're not a real doctor. <laughs> Isn't that what they say usually? <laughs> I feel you because when I say, is there a, a doctor on the plane? You know, and I say, you know, I'm a doctor in engineering. Then, you know, go back to the back. So I, I, I know what you're talking about. And the other thing I really put most of my work in is respiratory flows. So. Actually, when you breathe in air, air is technically a fluid. Gases and liquids are all part of this family of fluids. And basically, it's like physics of how air goes and travels into uh, your lungs. So I'll try to illustrate this, basically. Um, so, and I'm gonna make a little ad here, I'll take a second. Uh, I'd like to emphasize that the courses that I teach are in fact in English. Uh, the Technion offers now graduate programs that are English taught. This is what is called here the International School of Engineering. Look it up online for those of you who are ever interested in doing, say, an exchange program. And not only that, who's heard of a MIT Open Courseware? So basically, right, you have these lecture notes and, 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 and the lectures that are filmed and available for you. So the Technions got on that chip and they record our, our, our lectures and then you have access to them from home. Uh, I never like to watch myself again. I don't know, I, I hate the sound of my voice, but th does anybody like the sound of their voice usually? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> there we go. <laughs> All right. So what you're seeing here, for those of you who love science, you're seeing essentially imaging data of airways of a trachea and the mouth, like with a CT, they reconstruct it into a geometry that looks like a three-dimensional geometry. And then we use essentially fancy software to compute how air flows into your lungs, and all these little particles, where do they end up going? So this stuff, who's asthmatic here? So you definitely need to watch this, all right? Because it turns out that most of these inhalers do a, a relatively poor job at bringing uh, the drugs that you need to uh, treat or at least uh, alleviate your asthmatic attacks. And 
that's a lot of my motivation, is trying to understand where particles that you inhale, ultimately, where on earth do they deposit, and can we get them to deposit where they need to go? For those of you who aren't scared of blood, uh, basically, I teach a course on blood flow, and you're seeing simulations on the left of how uh, flow looks in a, in a carotid bifurcation and what aneurysm look like. And basically, the idea that I teach is essentially relating uh, bypass surgery, uh, stent implants, and so on and so forth with how does it alter the flow of blood into your arteries and vessels. So I'm, I'm in the department, the flow man. That's, that's, that's my, my bread and butter. Okay. Have most of you heard of what the lungs are? <laughs> yes. Schematically, they look something like what you see on the left. It's like basically take a tree outside, flip it over, and you look like you have a trunk, and it branches out. And all these little airways, what's fascinating, at least to me, is that they branch and branch and branch into tiny little pockets, what are called alveoli, or alveolar sacs. And these little air pockets get the oxygen and the carbon dioxide across the lungs into the blood vessels, which are schematically shown here. And it's kind of a funny place, because if you took a walk inside the airways, it would look like a weird cave where you would have all these little openings on the right. And basically the last generations of this airway tree, which looks like a tree with branches, looks pretty much like a broccoli. And all these little bumps that you see are nothing else than the alveoli. And that's where I spend most of my time thinking about stuff. Not literally being, you know, put into a warping machine that gets me into there, but I start to think a little bit along these, these, these paths. Uh, and what I do is I don't work with animals. I'm a classic kind of engineer, so I build models. And these models look like this. So try to bring a photo. Uh, you might have remember from the video that I sh you saw about the Technion's 100th birthday, at some point they saw IBM and these silicon wafers to build essentially computer chips. Well, this is a spun-off technology from these computer chips. Instead of building integrated circuits for electronics, we build essentially channels where we can pass all kinds of flows. So what we try to do is put on a chip essentially models of these airways. And one of the awesome things you can do with this chip is you can start growing little cells. So what we do is we try to make an in vitro, a fake sort of environment of the lungs, and we put little airway cells to grow up in, into these channels until ultimately it looks like the inside of your airways, or at least to some extent. So this is essentially cells that have essentially devised until they've populated this sort of artificial lung airway. And then we test all sorts of uh, physiological tests, including, for instance, uh, do they produce the surfactant that are needed inside your lungs? Anybody know what surfactant is? It's basically that soapy liquid that makes sure that your lungs stay open. For instance, if you've heard of infant respiratory distress syndrome, that's when children have a lot of difficulty in, in, in right after birth being able to distend their airways. And what you need to do is artificially bring in that soapy liquid to sort of alleviate the lungs from collapsing together. Okay? So that's the cell, that's the biology that goes into my little models. And here's a movie. Uh, so this is actually one of the examples I'm holding here. Uh, so there are a couple of hundred microns wide. And what we do is we also started testing essentially if you have things like chronic obstructive disease where you have buildup of mucus, we try to uh, build models that replicate how mucus travels in your airways. So you're seeing essentially these divisions of the mucus uh, that goes through these, these models, okay? So I spend basically my life testing flows, having a blast in the lab, and giving a chance to my students to, to wander around in all sorts of direction as long as I can you know, relate a little bit to the problem uh, they pose. Uh, I was telling you about the asthmatics here in the room. One of the reasons why it's, it's so important is I was trying to tell you, there are a bunch of ways to try to address uh, inhalation of therapeutic into the lungs. 
And people have thought of, of, of different kinds of inhalers, nebulizers, and putting spacers and masks. The bottom line is that until today, yet working solutions, nevertheless, uh, we, there's a tendency to have to sort of over flood your lungs with medicine to make sure that we alleviate whatever chronic attacks you have. Because most of the particles either deposit where they shouldn't, say in the mouth or in the trachea, rather than where really you have an infection. So this sort of motivates a lot of my basic science to work on. Uh, and so we look at where particles flows. So we use again these little chips and start flowing fluorescent particles and seeing where they go. On the left you see a kind of movie showing you uh, in pseudo re real time where particles go. And then we map essentially the flow. Remember, I do flows and fluid mechanics. So this is sort of a reconstruction of how flows look like. All right. And what we do is we take these little chips again, since they're my bread and butter, and we actuate them with pumps to recreate artificial kind of breathing. And so what you're seeing here is a single alveolus and the way essentially uh, particles go in and out of alveoli. And we do this all over a tree and try to map essentially what happens to whatever particles you've inhaled. So you're seeing this back and forth motion just like you're sitting down and, and breathing. And the last branch of things I do, which are again related to this basic problem, are this is uh, thank PowerPoint. You don't have to thank me for this, for all the movie stuff. But um, we do simulations. So we do essentially algorithms that compute artificially uh, what would happen with particles that are inhaled. And that's what I do most of the time in my research is essentially try to solve problems related to inhaling particles and the future of essentially inhalation aerosols. So if you came to my lab and you asked like, where am I gonna go with this? The basic line is that I'm pretty much working on basic science and I try to understand with these kind of tools uh, how the physics of respiration go and try to predict where aerosols uh, finally deposit. And the sort of timeline for people who are obviously interested in translational medicine and companies and products, I'd say, you know, it's probably gonna take another 10 years before we can come up from this basic science and give sort of new guidelines to where uh, aerosol inhalation should be going. And that's what I do. And I don't ask you actually to remember any of this. But what I do ask you is, for those of you who have any interest, not in my research necessarily, but of coming to Israel and being part of this experience, then do get in touch with us, because you know, at the end of the day, we do share all a common experience. Even those artists out there and the dentist, let me get back to the dentist, you can also come and help clean teeth here. It'd be great. It'd be a nice, it'd be really helpful. So thanks, have a blast. It's gonna be awesome, I'm sure it is already, all right? Thank you. A man named Paul Pollock, he's a guy from Colorado, wrote a book about three years ago. One of the things he wrote in the book was that the majority of world's designers focus all their efforts in producing products and services for the 10% richest people in the world, and nothing more than a revolution in concept, in design, will be required in order to reach the other, other 90%. Now, I don't wanna talk about whether it's 90% or 84%, but there's a huge disparity between the world that has and the world that hasn't, okay? And the word, the key word here, revolution, is what we're gonna talk about today. How do we start this revolution? Why engineering for the developing world? Now, I don't wanna get bogged down in numbers. My numbers might be wrong, but they're not that far off. Today, in the world we all live in, one billion people live on less than one dollar a day. Two billion people on less than two dollars a day. 30,000 children die every day for perfectly senseless reasons. One billion people don't have clean water to drink. Two billion people do not have decent hygiene sanitation in their lives. How many cell phones in the world? Five billion cell phones. How many toothbrushes? 
Four billion. Less toothbrushes than cell phones. How much money is spent a second, every second of every day, on armaments? Weapons. $32,000. Every second of every day. You can hire a high school teacher every second of every day. How come we have this disparity in the world? What's going to happen? How are we going to deal with it? And where is it going to lead us? Over the next 20 years, we figure there's going to be another 2 billion people in the world. Now, those 2 billion people that are going to, that are going to join our population, most of them are going to join that 86% or 90%, the ones that have not. And this is going to have huge stress on our world. How are we going to balance out the difficulties of providing food, shelter, communications, transportations, infrastructure, clean water, sanitation, to all the people in the world that haven't got it today? And I remind you, there are five billion cell phones in the world, so they know it's out there. And they want it just as bad as we don't want to give it up. So we have to make changes in the world. And the weird thing is, we don't get taught this. No one teaches how to deal with all these aspects that are going to happen in the world. Engineering students who are going to have to deal with a lot of these things aren't given a course on development engineering. Let's talk about that a bit. What do we got here? What's that? Somebody switched the lights off in the world. Tell me something about the picture. Dark. Where is it dark? Why is Africa so dark? Africa is dark <laughs> because there is not a lot of energy. In Africa, the fact that oil is plentiful does not mean that the oil is reaching people. Now, we, we might come back to that in a bit, but I want to talk about the connection between energy, health, and household economy. Three billion people in the world, that's almost half the world's population, cooks, lights, and heat their houses by using solid waste. Who is not the rock band? It's the World Health Organization, OK? Um, and that's, that's a piece of data from who? Tell me something about this picture. Yes, it's in Africa. Who's, what's happening? We just heard a lecture about respiratory difficulties. What's going on here? Look carefully, because if you notice, what's that? It's not just the mother that's getting sick from cooking on wood. It's the children that are also getting sick from cooking on wood. This is a problem called indoor smoke. This is called the energy ladder. X-axis, increasing cash, more prosperity, more development. Vertical axis, what do you cook on? If you're poor, you cook on, you cook on shit. If you have a little bit more money, you cut down wood, then charcoal, then coal, and then you go over to kerosene, electricity, natural gas. We cook on natural gas and electricity. That's what we cook on. Let's use this as an example. Engineers today are not taught to deal with the problem of the developing world. I say, and a lot of other people in the world say, that it's time we start changing what we teach in engineering. We should start breeding a new type of engineer, and we're calling him the global engineer. He'll do more than just crunch numbers. He's supposed to have the ability to sustain social and economic change. He's supposed to be able to work in sustainable development, build capacity in a community, use appropriate technologies. He might even be able to be a peacemaker if he, if he does his work correctly. I want to talk about this, basically, over the next few minutes that I have now. I thought about this for quite some time. How do we deal? How do we make the change in mindset? And the word change here is a difficult one to swallow. Any of you guys that are studying engineering may realize that we don't give enough social content in engineering courses. We specifically focus on math, physics, chemistry, analysis, design, capstone project, but nowhere along the line, social conscience. 
Now, when I went to university, the humanity courses that I took at the U of T were rocks for jocks. Anyone take that? Physics for poets and presidents. And of course, my personal favorite, pigs in space. But no one helped me connect my engineering to society. Despite the fact that most big engineering universities may give great curriculums, they don't give students the opportunity to use their hands. Now, I've done a lot of work in different parts of the world, and I've taken students to different places of the world. And I remember a student who had just finished a bachelor's degree, and I asked her to make, to make up a batch of concrete, and she burst out crying. Not because she didn't know how to make concrete, but because she had just spent $120,000 on a university education in civil engineering, and she couldn't make concrete. So the difficulty here is how do we implement into the same framework hands-on abilities? And the third one, which might sound to you guys a little bit corny, but it's not to me, is that I want my students to be leaders. I want them to be able to make positive change. I'm counting them on them to make positive change. In Israel, I'm tired of the fact that we leave everything in society up to who? The lawyers, the businessmen, the economists, the journalists in Israel, our personal favorites. The ex-army generals. No, I think engineers, scientists, doctors, veterinarians, where's the medicine guy? Where's the dentist? All of them should be getting involved, not in politics, but in taking leadership roles. And this is sort of a neat slide that I took out of The Economist several years ago. These are the, the professions that people have gone into politics from. Law, business, diplomacy, military, journalism, economics. The bottom of the, the, dread, the dredge Medicine, academia, at the bottom of the engineering. And I can understand why. Because we were never taught to think that way. We were taught to crunch the numbers. Okay, number crunching. I want to breed something new. And I'm calling him the global engineer. And I was told the very first day I came to work at the Technion that if I ever gave a lecture that didn't have an equation in it, they could fire me. So. GE stands for global engineer. And CE is going to stand for conventional engineer. And this is important. The conventional engineer has got to be inside the global engineer. He's got to have all the same tools as the conventional engineer, but he needs a supplement. He needs an engineering increment or supplement. And in most big organizations, if you want to make change, be careful. Big boats, big universities do not change quickly. They can't change the direction. But if you just you want to make an increment of change, a delta of change, it's a little bit easier for them to understand. And then the question here is, what's in that increment? What do I want to give the student to make that change? And how am I going to administer it? Just like any other class in calculus or algebra, that didn't work so far. Maybe we should make some change. And one of the changes I can promise you that this will do is very, very simple. How many engineers here? Engineering students. That's not enough. Any girl engineering students? One of the biggest problems with my profession is that there are not enough females in engineering. Typically, it's below 20%. And females are typically smarter. They typically see a wider picture. They are much more connected to social concepts, and they will actually improve our profession. The program that we run attracts girls and makes my job a lot more fun. So, what we've done here is divided this thing into three groups. I'm going to talk about two of them, basically just one of them today. Something we've called Engineers Without Borders, which is practical hands-on engineering type concepts, education, and something for the universities so they think that they're doing something good. Universities have difficulty with that. Engineers Without Borders started about nine years ago in, in the United States. The aim, from the outside at least, of Engineers Without Borders is to allow these kids who are carrying water. This girl is a girl from Belize. 
She doesn't go to school. She carries water back and forth from the river to her village. Do you know that every day, 16 million hours of water carrying is done by women every day in the world? This is the project, this is the project in Belize. They went back to this village, put in a very simple pumping system to bring water from the river to her village so she'd go to school. This is a Technion project. It's difficult to see, but that's a woman carrying water up a steep hill. Group of Technion students went over and built a rainwater catchment system on one of the schools so the school would have water. But that's not what it's about. It's not just about making good things in the world happen. It's about learning to use our skills to make positive change. I want to make impact. I want my students to make impact. I want to change the world. How can we do it? Short example. True story, everything that you're going to see here has been going on for the past four years. Four years ago, I sent two students, two female students in this case, to a small village at this end of Nepal. That's Ilam, very close to the India border. Anyone been to Nepal? Okay, I might need your help soon. Um, Ilam is a very small province. They grow tea there. In the province of Ilam, there is a village called Nam Saling. Nam Saling has about 1,000 families. Most families live on something like four or five dollars a day. Most families have two water buffaloes and a couple of pigs. And the students went out to do a survey. And one of the things they surveyed was, when they walked around the village was, how many, how, how many people are sick with diarrhea? Every dot on the map or is a household that was surveyed. They surveyed about a third of the houses in the village. And they found out that 85% of the village was sick with diarrhea five days before the survey was carried out. And it's always like that. Why are they sick with diarrhea? Water. The water is bad. They drink surface water. They don't pump the water. Why is the water bad? OK, this is the why the water is bad. Together with the village, children of the village went out and tested the waters. And they found that cattle and people are polluting the waters. How's that for an executive summary? If you get a report like that, that was done perfectly. Well, it tells the whole story in about two seconds. So human waste and animal waste is poisoning the waters. Of those of you that have been to Nepal, does this picture ever look familiar? 95% of Nepalis cook, heat, and light their houses by burning wood. And who carries the wood? The woman with the children. In Nepal, what time do they go to school in the morning? 10.30, typically. Until 10.30, they're collecting wood with their mother. What do they do with that wood? Meet Indira. Took a long time for Indira to let me cook in her kitchen. But this is Indira in her kitchen. And she's cooking on a wood stove, typically not in her house. This is a small cabin beside her house. And look what's coming out of the house here, out of the cabin. And she sits there eight hours a day. I couldn't sit there for 10 minutes without coughing up black stuff. So here we got a village that's cutting down their trees, which is a natural resource. They're burning the wood, which is CO2 going to the atmosphere. They're getting sick from drinking the water, and they're getting sick from respiratory disease. A Nepali woman has 3,000% times higher the chance of getting lung disease than a woman in Israel. So the students started to think what we could do. And they came up with the concept of bioreactors. Very simple concept, concept. It's very ancient, actually. There are a couple hundred thousand reactors in China. This is a household reactor, which means we could build one for, every, for a household in the village. It's six meters cubed. Basically, it's just a hole in the ground filled with concrete. This is all, the orange stuff is concrete, and the gray stuff is concrete. And every day, if you put about 100 pounds, which is about 50 kilos, of excrement, whether it be from an animal or human, into the, into the di digester, you will get five to six hours of methane 
every day to cook on, to light with, and to heat with. The other side of the reactor spews out fertilizer. It's basically the nutrients. If anybody's worked on a farm here in the past, you don't take the cow dung and put it directly on the crops. It has to sit and rot. As it's rotting, basically, the methane is leaving the cow dung. That's the same methane that we want to catch and burn. So the students put their heads together on this, and they actually made an entire engineering project out of this. And the concept of the project was to deal with deforestation, to deal with clean energy, to develop clean energy, to clean up the water. How is that going to help cleaning up the water? The cow dung and the human excrement will go into the reactor rather than going into the water sources. Health issues, both water and air. It's obviously very environmental, produces fertilizer, and can produce livelihood. I'm going to show you a set of photographs now that together with the Nepali villagers, they passed on a low-tech startup. Not a high-tech startup, but there are now two Nepali companies doing what we developed. The most important aspect about this is that we're dealing with a whole bunch of different problems. Typically in engineering, when you solve something, what happens? You create a new problem, very good. And if you're lucky, just one, sometimes it's two. We couldn't figure out what the problem was here. What new problem had we developed? We later found out. Never, ever, ever build one bioreactor for two families. Because one family will always collect more shit than the other. And then whose gas does it belong to? So this is what happened. Students put together a project, very flashy, very lightweight. We had to carry it six hours on our back. That's the distance from the road to Namsaling. Very fancy, very, a very efficient scaffolding system. They covered the thing up with concrete, take out the scaffolding system from the inside, and three months later, Indira has gas. And it works, and we've made 60 of these. What was wrong with this picture? There's something wrong with this set of pictures. Who did all the work? The Israeli students from the Technia. The idea is to make this thing sustainable, maintainable, and copyable. Eight months after that, the same group came back after they learned their lessons from building the first one around. Everything you're going to see in this set of photographs, they found in the village. Nepal is full of bamboo. These are bamboo rods and these are metal rods. They made the entire thing out of bamboo. The Nepalis built the entire system. There are now two companies in Nepal, in the same village, building these in villages around them. Not only have we created a type of solution for a problem they have, we've also created livelihood ability. So far we've built 60. We want to build 950 in that same village. Each reactor saves each family from carrying 12 tons of wood every year. So we've got 60 reactors times 12 tons. Just think how much wood is being saved. Instead of letting the methane go into the atmosphere, we're cooking on the methane in the, in, in the kitchen. We still have to follow up on health issues to see over time, if health issues are going to improve in, in the village, but this is a win-win situation. There's no downside here. We've taken a waste product and turned it into a commodity. Outcomes here are amazing. Um, students learn about sustainability, environmental aspects firsthand with their hands. It's amazing PR. These pictures, you can use them for anything. It turns these students into professionals. The concept of community, the concept of social conscience, and leadership. I promise you, students that do this kind of thing turn into better engineers, better scientists, and better employees. I was at a conference in Washington about a, a year ago, and I ran across the Peace Corps. Let's look at some of the posters they have on the building. This is one of the posters they had, JFK with Sergeant Shriver. We must seek above all a world of peace, a world in which people dwell together in mutual respect and work together. That was JFK. 
The Peace Corps represents everything, if not all, of the best virtues in the society. It stands for everything that America has stood for. It stands for everything we believe in and hope to achieve in the world, Shriver. The smallest change can make the biggest difference. What if you gave your all and got back even more? What if you help others and in the process help yourself? I maintain that this is the point in time where Israel is today. Israel's a very young country, 60-something years old. But so quickly have we grown to the point where now we can be a country to help others. We can institute change. Every one of you, wherever you come from, can institute change by making positive impact in what you do. Everything is about impact. And the things that we do at EWB and the things that we're trying to do a in the concept of global engineering, the development of global engineers, is about making positive impact. In Nepal, the word for shalom, loosely, is namaste. Namaste. 